Good day everyone, so today we're going to tackle about the rebirth of the Filipinos and at the same time, we're going to discuss the factors that led to the rise of Philippine nationalism. But before anything else, let's define first the meaning of nationalism. So according to Andres Bonifacio, nationalism was the highest and purest kind of love. It was also the state of mind and deep sentiments of a certain group of people towards their native land and to the people who belong to the nation. So sa madaling salita, pag sinabi nating nationalism, ito yung pagmamahal na isang tao or a group of people sa kanilang sariling bansa. Filipino nationalism began when the people in the Philippines already realized that their country was the Philippines and they were Filipinos. Alright, now let's proceed to the factors that led to the rise of Philippine nationalism. So the first factor is the rise of liberal ideas. Paano ba nakapasok yung liberal ideas sa Pilipinas before? Okay, so the liberal ideas came to the Philippines through the continuous contact of the Filipino illustrators with the West. Remember na may mga Pilipino noon na nakapag-aral sa Europa at kung ano yung mga natutunan nila doon na idala nila dito sa Pilipinas nung sila ay nakauwi. And kung i-compare natin yung mga countries sa Europe dito sa Pilipinas, mas liberal yung policy nila ron or yung pag-iisip ng mga uh, tao doon unlike here in the Philippines na limitado dahil nga sakop tayo ng mga Spanyol. So noong 1700, naranasan ng Europe na magkaroon ng iba't ibang revolution when it comes to religion and in government. So in the aspect of religion, nakilala si Martin Luther. Sino ba si Martin Luther? So he is a German clergy na kinwestiyon niya yung iba't ibang policies ng church na sa tingin niya ay hindi naman tumutugma dun sa tinuturo ng Biblia, particularly dun sa giving of indulgence. Ano ba tong indulgence or yung indulhensya? Ito yung mga binabayaran ng mga tao sa simbahan para daw pag namatay sila yung kaluluwa nila ay mapunta sa langit na kinwestiyon ni Martin Luther. Sabi niya, hindi naman align or hindi naman tumutugma dun sa tinuturo ng Biblia. So nagkaroon ngayon ng issue sa pagitan ni Martin Luther at saka mga kasama niya and of course dun sa Catholic Church. To the move of Martin Luther shaken the absolute power of the Catholic Church. Gambala ang church dun sa ginawa ni Martin Luther. Kaya nagkaroon ng revolution when it comes to the aspect of religion. Now let's proceed to the aspect of government naman. Ito naman sa government na sa may France. Okay? So the French people nagkaroon sila ng revolution against the monarchy of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Okay? So ano bang nangyari? Bakit ba nagkaroon ng revolution sa France? Uh, ito kasi yung dalawang ito, itong mag-asawa na si King Louis XVI and si Marie Antoinette, uh, they impose excessive taxes to the people and then yung taxes na nakokolekta nila or yung pera, binibili nila ng mga luho nila. Okay? So they use it for their luxury and did not implement projects for the welfare of the uh, people. They decided to have their own revolution and to overthrow the monarch. So dito na nagkaroon ng idea yung iba't ibang tao na you know, they had the power to break the contract to their government kapag hindi nila nagugustuhan, especially kapag inaabuso na yung mga rights nila. And of course, they can question and challenge the absolute power of the government. Now, let's proceed to the second factor that led to the rise of Philippine nationalism. We have the development in international trading. The opening of Suez Canal gave way to the easy transportation from Europe going to Asia. Take note, noong 19th century, nagbukas ang Suez Canal. Itong Suez Canal na to ay ruta siya na papunta sa Europe to Asia or Asia papunta rin yung Europe. And then, instead of crossing the Atlantic, yung mga barko, they would pass the Suez Canal and this shortened the time of travel. So, napaiksi yung oras ng pagbabiyahe at the same time, yung ruta, mas napaiksi siya. Okay? Noong 1834, ang Port of Manila ay nagbukas sa international trade and this brought tremendous development in the economy of the Philippines. Of course, nung nagkaroon na ng kalakalan at nakisali ang Pilipinas sa kalakalan, nagkaroon ng development sa ating ekonomiya. Especially sa mga uh, mga ngalakal, sa mga Pilipinong mga ngalakal. And then, the Hacienderos and the Inquilinos were able to participate in the trading of tobacco, rice, sugar, abaca, and other Filipino goods. So, anong naging effect nito? Of course, nagkaloon sila ng big profit. 
And then this big profit gave them opportunity to send their children in Europe para mag-aral. At yung iba pa nga, mas pinipili na lang nilang mag-settle sa Europe to avoid the restrictions set by the Spaniards. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, na kung ikukumpara natin mga countries sa Europe, sa Pilipinas, mas liberal doon or mas open-minded sila and walang restriction. And then, aside from the Filipinos, of course, the Chinese in the Philippines also gained wealth because of the international trade. And, di ba pagka sinabi natin Chinese sa Pilipinas, number one na papasok sa isip natin ay yung Binondo. Okay? So, their community in Binondo gained influence because of their uh, participation in trading and the wealth that they have. Okay, now let's proceed to the third factor, uh, the political instability in Spain. So, like the other government, the absolute power of the Spanish monarch was threatened by liberalism. So, kung ano yung nangyari dun sa France, ganun din yung nangyari sa Spain. Okay? So, kinwestiyon ng mga uh, Spanish people yung kanilang government. Uh, kung baga sa Spain kasi nahati yung population nila when it comes to type of government na gusto nila. So, yung iba, mas prefer nilang magkaroon ng liberal government while the others prefer absolutism. So, ang nangyari sa Spain on ay nagkaroon ng continuous changes in the monarchy of Spain. So, pabago-bago sila ng namumuno. During the Napoleonic Wars, the Spanish monarchy had a lot of expenses. So, itong Napoleonic Wars na to, it's a war na nangyari sa Spain. So, syempre, kapag may war, expected na maraming masisira, maraming mawawala, and then yung funds ng government mauubos din. So, anong ginawa nila para makabangon sila after ng war? They impose additional tax to the people. Siyempre, nagkaroon na ng problema sa kanilang ekonomiya. So, ito yung naging dahilan kung bakit yung mga tao ay gusto nila magkaroon ng reforma sa government. So, nagkaroon ng Cadiz Constitution of 1812. It mandated the transformation of the Spanish government. So, from monarchy to the constitutional monarchy. Okay? So, maraming changes na nangyari sa kanilang constitution before. And the changes made by the adaptation of the new constitution brought confusion to the Spanish people. Yung majority ng uh, population sa Spain, mas gusto nila yung old system of government because their perspective in the new system was just a new version of the absolutism government of France. The continuous change of the government from absolute to liberal government and from liberal to absolute government brought instability not only in the Spanish government but also to the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines. So, dahil nga sakop tayo ng Spain at mismong sa country nila is hindi naman stable yung kanilang government na damay pati mga colony ng Spain. Okay, now let's move on to another factor that led to the rise of Philippine nationalism. We have the administration of Carlos Maria de la Torre. Okay, so uh, si Governor General Carlos Maria de la Torre ay isa siyang liberal leader na na-assign sa Philippines as the Governor General in 1868. Sa lahat ng mga naging Governor General sa Pilipinas way back then, si Carlos Maria de la Torre ang pinakamahal ng mga Pilipino dahil siya ay isang liberal. When you say liberal kasi, um, open-minded siya at the same time, hindi siya stricto. Okay? So, ano ba yung mga ginawa ni Carlos Maria de la Torre? First, he opened Malacanang to the Filipinos and solicited suggestions from the natives about the administration of the country. So, imagine that uh, head siya ng siya yung pinakamataas na pinuno sa Pilipinas noon and then hinihingan niya ng suggestion yung mga natives or yung mga Pilipino about the administration sa Pilipinas kung paano pamumunuan, kung ano yung mga gusto ng mga Pilipino. So in short, nakikinig siya dun sa mga uh, constituents niya. Okay? Governor General Carlos Maria de la Torre also abolished the espionage and implemented freedom of speech. So ano ba tong espionage? Ito yung paggamit ng government ng spy or ng espia as, as their strategy sa kanilang mga kalaban. Okay? So he also implemented freedom of speech. Nakakatuwa pa kay Governor de la Torre ay eh, instead na mag-declare siya ng war against na sa mga rebelde, uh, kinakausap niya, nakikipag-meet siya, and then ini-encourage niya na supportahan sila dun sa Spanish government, or to encourage them to support the Spanish government, I should say. Okay? So his liberal ideas made him the champion for the Filipinos, but of course, kung mahal siya ng mga Pilipino, kabaliktaran naman nung nangyari, 
dun sa mga Spanyol at sa mga pari na galit sa kanya. Okay? So, after two years, he was replaced by Governor General Rafael Izquierdo who imposed repressive policies towards the natives. So, pinalitan na si Carlos Maria de la Torre ang pumalit sa kanya, si Rafael Izquierdo na kinamumuhian naman ng mga Pilipino. Uh, take note na si Governor General Rafael Izquierdo ang nagpapatay dun sa tatlong paring Gomburza. So, the administration of Carlos Maria de la Torre in the country gave ideas to the Filipinos na okay lang or it was possible for the government to adopt the liberal ideas. Now, let's proceed to the fifth factor, the issue of secularization. Okay, so dun sa previous lesson natin na uh, Cavite Mutiny na mention ko ang issue of secularization. Ano bang meron dito sa secularization na to? Okay, take note na nabanggit ko before na may two congregation ang pari or ang church, regular priest and the secular priest. Ang mga regular priest, ito yung mga pari na Espanyol, okay, mga Spanish priest to. Mga secular priest naman, ito yung mga uh, paring Pilipino or Filipino priest. So the liberal administration in Spain ordered the closure of all churches in Spain so the friars traveled to the Philippines. As I mentioned kanina, na dahil dun sa policy na ginawa ng Spanish government which pinasara nila lahat ng simbahan sa Spain yung mga Spanish priests mumunta sa Pilipinas ang problema saan sila dadalhin or saan simbahan sila i-assign tinanggal nila yung mga uh, secular priests or yung mga paring Pilipino dun sa simbahan mismo dito sa Pilipinas and then sila yung pumalit and dahil dito nagkaroon ng secularization movement and then what's the objective of this secularization? Uh, its objective is to fight for the rights of the secular priest and it was headed by Father Pedro Pelaez and Father Mariano Gomez. Kaya lang namatay si Padre uh, Pelaez dahil sa lindol na nangyari sa Manila. So ang pumalit sa kanya ay si Father Jose Burgos. So now let's proceed to the next factor, the execution of Gomburza. Paano ba pumasok yung Gomburza para mapaigting pa yung pagiging nationalismo na mga Pilipino. Okay, so in 1861, Archbishop Gregorio Meliton Martinez issued a decree which removed the parishes of the secular priests from them and transferred it under the control of the Spanish priests. The secular priests fought for their rights and sought the assistance of Marshal Francisco Serrano. Sino tong si Marshal Francisco Serrano? He was the regent of Spain during those times. However, the supremacy of the regular priests was dominant so, and even the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines could not contradict their decisions. Okay, now let's try to discuss uh, the important details about the three priests or the three martyr priests, Father Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora. So let's begin with Father Gomez. Father Mariano Gomez was known for his leadership in Baco or Cavite, not only in the spiritual development of the parishioners but also in economics. Ano ba yung pag-uugali ni Father Mariano Gomez? So, pinapahiraman niya ng pera yung mga parishioners without interest, okay? And then, hindi lang siya kilala sa Baco or Cavite but also kilala din siya sa Batangas because when they needed to raise funds for the representative of the secular priest to Vatican, itong si Father Gomez ay isa dun sa mga nagsolicit ng pondo. Okay? Okay, now let's move on naman kay Father Burgos. Father Jose Burgos was the most promising among the three priests. Why? Because through his writings, he defended the secular priests against the Spanish priests who insisted that the Filipino priests were not deserving to have their own parish. So itong si Father Jose Burgos ang pumalit kay Father Pedro Pelaez bilang kura paroko ng Manila. And yung mga sinulat niyang essay ang mas nagpagalit pa dun sa mga Spanish priests. Okay? And lastly, let's proceed to Father Zamora. Father Jacito Zamora was the parish priest in Marikina. He was the classmate of Jose Burgos and also part of the secularization movement. In January 1872, the workers in Cavite Arsenal had the rebellion against the additional deductions in their salary and the loss of exemption in tribute. Okay, so dun sa Cavite Mutiny, nangyari to sa may Cavite Arsenal. Itong Arsenal, na-mention ko sa previous lesson, na ang Arsenal, ito yung pagawaan ng mga armas, ng mga warship, or anything na ginagamit kapag may digmaan. Okay? So, nagka-problema dahil ito mga manggagawa sa Cavite Mutiny at tinanggalan sila ng mga karapatan. Una, yung exemption nila sa polo iservisyo or yung pal sa pilitang pagtatrabaho. Pangalawa, 
yung tinaasan yung kanilang buwis. Paano papasok yung tatlong paring ito? Okay? So, naakusahan sila na sila daw yung leader nung Cavite Mutiny. Okay? So, dahil ito sa testimony ng isang tao na si Francisco Zaldua, the only witness that they had that the leaders of the Cavite Mutiny were the Filipino priests and without due process, ito na, si Governor General Rafael Izquierdo ang um, nagpapatay dun sa tatlong paring martyr. So, naging eye-opener siya sa mga Pilipino that all people could experience the injustice of the Spaniards, even the workers of the church. Okay? So, ang nangyari ito, of course, it awakened the nationalistic spirits of the Creoles and sought reform from the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines. Okay? As they say, na the Cavite Mutiny was the beginning of the birth of Philippine nationalism. Kasi sunod-sunod na yung events na nangyari, actually. Uh, nangyari yung Cavite Mutiny, pinapatay yung Bomborza, and then, nagkaroon ng Filipino Revolution. Si Rizal ay 10 years old pa lamang nung napatay ang Gomburza. Dahil yung kuya niya na si Pasyano ay close kay Father Burgos. Now, let's proceed to the last factor that led to the rise of Philippine nationalism. We have the rise of the Creoles. So, eto mga Creoles, eto yung mga may lahi. It's either half Filipino, half Chinese, or half Filipino, half Spanish. So, the Creoles was considered as the third class in the Philippine society during the Spanish era. Oh, they were the result of the intermarriage of the natives, Spaniards, and Chinese. Their education gave them the idea about the good government, equality, and right of the people to overthrow the government. The Creoles used propaganda to encourage the Filipino people to seek reform in the government, and they succeeded in awakening the injustice or the masses to put into actions all of their struggles. Now, let's move on to the first wave of struggle against the Spaniards. The first wave of struggle of the Filipinos against the Spaniards did not aim for the total independence of the country from Spain, but for first, political reform, second, equality between Filipinos and Spaniards, and third, assimilation of the Philippines from Spain. So, remember this, na yung unang reforma na hinihingi ng uh, mga Pilipino noon sa Spaniards ay hindi total independence o hindi kalayaan. Ang gusto lang mangyari ng mga Pilipino noon ay magkaroon ng equality between Filipino and Spaniards and then some changes in the government na makaka-benefit naman sa kanila. And lastly, yung assimilation of the Philippines from Spain. So meaning to say, maging probinsya ng Spain ang Pilipinas. The Filipinos before wanted the opportunity for the Filipinos to have their own government and of course, the presence or the existence of freedom of speech. And let's recall our lesson in the prelims, yung ano, uh, the Philippine condition during the 19th century. Remember na nung tayo ay sinakop ng Spain, uh, it was a centralized government. Okay, so may representative ang Spanish government dito sa Pilipinas na namamahala at namumuno. Okay, so way back then, during the 19th century, the natives were only allowed to assume the position of Gobernador Silio and Cabeza de Barangay. And the highest position were allotted for the Spaniards, di ba? So, yun lang yung position na pwedeng ma-attain ng mga Pilipino before. So, aside from this, they also demanded na magkaroon sila ng representation sa Spanish Cortes. Ito yung Spanish Court sa Spain para at least merong isang representative na magsasabi sa Spanish government sa Spain ko ano yung mga hinain nila or ano yung mga problema nila. And they also believe that if the Philippines would be assimilated to Spain and become the province of Spain, as I mentioned earlier, the rights and the privileges of the Spaniards would be enjoyed by the Filipinos. Okay, so para magkakaroon ng equality between uh, dun sa rights and privileges na ina-enjoy ng Spanish na pwede rin sanang ma-attain ng mga Pilipino. This was noted that in the perspective of the well-educated Filipinos, the country was not yet ready for independence since the Filipinos did not have education for a good government. Now, let's move on to the reformists. Okay, so first we have Jose Rizal. Rizal is the greatest reformist in the Philippine society and he was the first person who thought that the Philippines was a nation and the Filipinos should be united and educated to reform their own society. Okay, yung principle kasi ni Rizal, it's about education. Yung edukasyon ang magiging 
uh, parang solusyon sa problema ng Pilipinas. So his novels and essays inspired the Filipinos to write for their rights and for their independence. Ito yung naging platform niya para ihayag yung mga kamali ang ginagawa ng mga Spanish government and of course, para ma-inspire yung mga kapwa nating Pilipino. As we mentioned before, he came from a wealthy family of Mercado of Calamba, Laguna. So, dun siya ipinanganak. And may kaya yung pamilya ni Rizal. Okay, pinanganak siya noong June 19, 1861. Alam natin na si Rizal ay matalino simula nung bata pa lamang siya. Okay, so marami siyang awards na nakukuha. And his first novel, Nolimetang Re, exposed the cancer in the society of the Philippines during the Spanish era. And then he also discussed the abusive actions of the friars and the backward government of the Spaniards. And then dun sa essay niya na The Indolence of the Filipino People and the Philippines a century hence, he stated that the friars were the deceivers because they taught the wrong religion to the Filipinos and used it to satisfy their selfish intentions. So, si Rizal ay na-declare bilang erehe at pilibustero. Okay? When we say erehe, uh, ito yung mga tao na against dun sa policy ng, ng church. And pag pilibustero, ito naman yung mga tao against or contradict sa dun sa policy ng government. Or to make it simple, uh, erehe and pilibustero are the enemy of the church and the government. So, uh, pinatawan si Rizal bilang erehe at pilibustero. Okay? So, remember, he stayed in Europe for eight years where he moved freely. He founded the La Liga Filipina but the Spaniards plotted anti-government pamphlets on the luggage of his sister Maria when they returned to the country from Hong Kong. And then, dahil dito, ayun, pinatapon siya sa may dapitan sa Zamboanga for four years. And then, after four years, he volunteered as a doctor to the Pitan, but he was accused as the founder of KKK. So, siya'y napagbintangan na leader ng KKK. So, he was executed in December 30, 1896, and dahil dito, mas nagalit ang sabayan ng Pilipino. Okay? So, his death was the start of the new chapter of the history of the Filipinos. Next reformist we have is Graciano Lopez Haina. So, he is one of the greatest orators in the Philippine history, and he used his talent to expose the true conditions of the country under the Spanish rule. So, ano pa ba mga ginawa niya? He defended the Filipinos and let other nations know that uh, we, the Filipinos, were also capable to handle reform and development. Okay, si Graciano Lopez ay na ay pinanganak sa Iloilo. And he gained his education in the seminary but he did not continue because he criticized the friars. And Mayroon siyang isang ginawang literary work which is the Fray Botod. It's a novel about the friar which he described as a big-bellied man, abusive, immoral, and selfish. In 1889, together with other Filipinos in Madrid, they founded the La Solidaridad and it was him who became the first editor-in-chief of La Solidaridad. Ano ba tong La Solidaridad? It was a newspaper na nagpa-publish or naglalaman ng mga uh, true condition of the Philippines. And itong newspaper na to, it encouraged everyone to seek for reform. Si Graciano ay nakatira sa Spain without financial support from his family. And dahil sa kakulangan sa pondo, yung kanyang health ay nagsuffer. Okay? And ang ikinamatay niya ay tuberculosis and namatay siya noong January 20, 1896 in Barcelona. Now, let's move on to the third reformist. We have Marcelo H. Del Pilar. So, he became the second editor-in-chief of La Solidaridad. He was also a brilliant writer and a social reformer. So, katulad ng mga naunang nabanggit natin, he also used his pen to campaign for social justice and expose the hindrance in the attainment of the development in the Philippines. So, itong mga reformist na to, ang parang platform talaga nila is true writing. Doon nila ina-expose yung mga injustices ng mga Spanish government. So, he was born in Bulacan, Bulacan on August 30, 1850. So, he came from the family of writers. He studied in University of Santo Tomas and finished a law course. He used his mastery in Tagalog language to encourage the Filipinos to have self-dignity as a Filipino. 
So ito na, noong 1882, he founded the Jaryong Tagalog. It's a newspaper which published the nationalistic sentiments of the Filipinos. And then noong 1888, he also wrote the manuscript entitled Kaiingat Kayo, the manuscript which defended Rizal against the friars. Okay, dahil uh, ito mga friars na to, kumbaga, uh, they labeled Rizal as the enemy of the Catholic Church. So, bilang depensa ni Marcelo, isinulat niya yung kaiingat kayo. And lastly, he also wrote the Dasalan at Toksoan, which criticized the prayer, Our Father and Hail Mary. Del Pilar pointed out that the friars were greedy, and they used religion to get money and resources from the Filipinos. So, yung mga sinulat niya, katulad ng mga nauna, ay mas nagpaghalit sa mga friars. And then, they ordered his arrest But to avoid being arrested, he went to Spain in October 1888. Okay? So, sa Madrid, nung pagkarating niya sa Madrid, he continued his writings against the friars and the abusive policies of the Spaniards. Katulad kay Graciano, siya rin ay namatay dahil sa sakit na tuberculosis. So, he died in Madrid on July 4, 1896 without realizing his goals. Now, let's move on to the last. The Organization for Reform. So first, we have the Circulo Hispano-Filipino. It was an organization of Spanish and Filipino in Madrid, founded in 1882. So, etong organization na to, uh, they would use the propaganda or newspaper to expose the real situation of the Philippines and to catch the attention of the Spanish government in Madrid. Kaya lang, its existence ended when the Minister of Colonies discouraged the members to continue fighting for its aim. So, hindi rin siya nagtagal. So, next, we have the La Solidaridad. It was a newspaper which was the organ for the Filipinos to express their sentiments for the Philippines and against the Spanish colonial government. And it was founded on January 1, 1889. But the first subscription came out on February 15, 1889. So yung mga Pilipino noon, kapag interesado sila or meron silang nagawa na essay or articles, pwedeng-pwede nila itong ibigay doon sa editor-in-chief para uh, ma-publish din. Okay? So gumagamit sila ng pen name to avoid their identity by the Spanish government. Actually, usong-uso to noon sa mga reformists, they use pen names to avoid their identity or to hide their identity. For example, si Jose Rizal, uh, gumamit siya ng pen name na Dimas Alang and Laon Laang. So, the last solidaridad aimed for the secularization of the parishes in the Philippines, participation of the Filipinos in their own government, freedom of speech, equality, assimilation, and the representation of the Filipinos in the Spanish quarters. So, yun yung mga parang ine-aim or yung goal ng La Solidaridad. However, dahil sa kawalan ng pondo and nagkaroon din ng dispute or ng alitan sa mga members, hindi rin siya nagtagal. So, it ended on November 15, 1895. And lastly, we have the La Liga Filipina. Okay. So, this organization is a civic society founded by Dr. Jose Rizal. So, siya yung uh, nagpasimula ng La Liga Filipina. And nangyari ito sa bahay ni Doroteo Onghungko sa Laguna. The La Liga Filipina aimed for the unity of the whole archipelago, mutual protection of law, defense against violence and injustice, and application of the reforms needed by the society. Kaya lang, itong La Liga Filipina ay makoconsider din natin na failed. Dahil after three days ay pinatapon na si Rizal sa dapitan sa may Zamboanga. Okay? Dahil dun sa anti-government pamphlets na nahanap sa luggage ng kanyang kapatid na si Maria. So after may patapon si Rizal sa dapitan, yung mga members ng Laliga ay gusto pa rin i-continue or ituloy yung existence nitong organization na to. Kaya lang dahil sa alitan or conflict between its members, nahati siya sa dalawang grupo. So... Ayun, yun ang nangyari sa La Liga, Filipina. So, that's it for today's lecture. I hope you learned something. And the next topic would be the start of uprising or the Philippine Revolution. So, ito na yung katipunan. And madidiscuss natin yan on the next video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead.